Good morning again, and welcome back to Bible Fellowship Church in our continuing study of the book of Revelation. Let's open up with a word of prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, we pray that your word will go forth with great power, and as we study one of the greatest and most encouraging things in the history of the Bible, the return of Jesus Christ back to this earth to defeat his foes, we pray, Lord, that you'll encourage our hearts, strengthen us to walk in your ways, and to look forward to the time when you return, for it's in your glory and for your honor we ask this. Amen. Okay, today our topic is going to be um, chapter 19 of the book of Revelation. This is the passage that gives us the return of Jesus Christ. But there's still a little bit of a leftover from what we've been talking in chapter 17 and 18 in the destruction of Babylon. So we see there at the beginning, and I'm sorry my animation's not working on these slides, but we see the scene changing to heaven now, and heaven's rejoicing over God's victory over the great harlot, the great whore of Babylon that we saw in chapter 17 and 18. So we then see this great multitude praising God's glory and salvation. And some interpreters point out that this is the fourfold hallelujah. So hallelujah is mentioned four times in this passage of scripture in the next few verses. And it's the only time in the Greek Bible where the word is used, the transliteration of the Hebrew expression that we hear quite often in the Psalms. So uh, here we have the great hallelujah. After these things, verse 1. I heard something like a loud voice of a great multitude in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. So the scene shifts to a contemporary scene as John sees this great heavenly chorus begin to praise God for his glory and his salvation. Because this multitude is praising God's salvation, we have to see here that this involves all the redeemed, all those who he's saved, may also include the angels in heaven and so forth, but it certainly includes all of us will be there as well. Then we see them in verses 2 and 3, praising God's righteous judgments. Verse 2, because his judgments are true and righteous, for he has judged the great harlot who is corrupting the earth with her immorality, and he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. And a second time they said, Hallelujah, her smoke rises up forever and ever. Notice how again the judgment is seen as over from this viewpoint. So again, as we prepare for Jesus to return to the church, to the earth, it appears that this judgment on the great city of Babylon has already taken place and she's already been destroyed. And two reasons are given here. One, she's corrupting the whole earth with her false religion, okay? And she's guilty of murdering the righteous. These are two things that God hates. He hates it when his people are persecuted and killed, and he hates false religion because it leads people away from salvation. It leads people away from their true God and a knowledge and a relationship with their true God. So these are what God hates. God hates false religions that, that pull people away from the truth, and he even more hates people who persecute the right. Okay? And then, number three here, all the heavenly beings worship God and are exhorted to praise him. Verse four, and the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, amen, hallelujah, the third hallelujah. And a voice came from the throne saying, give praise to our God, all you his bondservants who fear him, the small and the great. And again, we see this vital relationship. I know I probably sound like a broken record at this point in time, but this vital relationship between bowing down and acknowledging the majesty and awesomeness of God and giving him praise, that this is a picture of true worship. 
So again, worship isn't about coming to a building and singing songs necessarily. It's about prostrating oneself, about making one's allegiance to the God of Israel, the God of Christ, the God of this world who has created the world and everything, and bowing before him and saying, I am yours, and praising him for what he has given you, what he has done, and his great mercies. That is true worship. So we then move on to the next slide. Is this one? Oh, I got the I got the, the animation working on this one. And this topic has to do with the marriage of the Lamb. So we see this scene in heaven. Again, we're still in heaven, opening up, and we're going to talk about this great event, this marriage of the Lamb. And so we see the multitude beginning to rejoice over God's reign. This is the fourth hallelujah. Verse 6. Then I heard something like the voice of a great multitude, like the sound of many waters, like the sound of mighty pearls of thunder. Now, I don't know how to describe that. You know, the sound of many waters the sound of mighty pearls of thunder. Whatever that sounds like, it's got to be majestic. It's going gonna, it's gonna to be astounding. This sound. And what is it doing? Hallelujah! For the Lord our God, the Almighty, reign. You see, on the, on the very brink of the return of Jesus Christ to set up His kingdom, Heaven announces the great hallelujah and says, our time for our God to reign now begins. Again, this looks forward to the unstoppable victory of the Lamb over the forces that are going to be arrayed against him. Spoken as if it's already happened, and it's sure because of the sovereignty of God and the outworking of his plan. Now, I was thinking about this this morning as I was writing this. I'm saying, in some ways, we understand that Satan is smart and powerful and all that, but in some ways, he's stupid. He's dumb. Doesn't he get it? Why is he continuing to gather his armies against the Son of God when the Bible is very clear that they're going to be wiped out and he's going to be thrown into the lake of fire? He's going to be bound. You know, doesn't he read the Bible? Doesn't he know this? Why does he keep trying to oppose the will of God? Does he really think that he can win? I don't know. Maybe he's deluded himself into thinking that somehow his rebellion will be successful against the creator of the universe. Well, verses 7 and 8. The bride is ready. Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Now, the majority of our time here this morning will be taking a look at who is this bride because there's quite a bit of discussion about this amongst Bible interpreters. So we'll take a look at three options here that we can try to discern. And the first one is, is this in reference to Israel or Old Testament believers? Okay, and we might take a look at Isaiah 54. Now again, this is a common thing. Those of you who have read through the Old Testament many times, you understand that this image of Israel being the wife of the Lord is a common thing throughout the prophets and in many places in the Old Testament. But let's just take a look at one example of that in Isaiah 54, 5 through 7. Let's read that together, and I have it up here on the board for you to see. For your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts, and your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel who is called the God of all the earth. 
For the Lord has called you like a wife forsaken and grieved in spirit, even like a wife of, young's, of one's youth when she's rejected, says your God. For a brief moment I forsook you, but with great compassion I will gather you. And, of course, you, you are familiar with the prophet Hosea, who was told to live out a family example of God's relationship to Israel in that he went and married a woman who was a prostitute. And she continually was unfaithful to him, and he'd take her back and forgive her and so forth. And so this whole image of Israel being the wife of the Lord is something that is quite prominent in the Old Testament. So is, is this the bride that we're talking about here? Well, the key problem with this view is that when we see this imagery in the Old Testament, without exception, it's pointing out that Israel is an unfaithful, adulterous wife. And the image of the bride we see here in heaven is that she's righteous. She's clothed in white linen. And she, she, those, that linen represents her righteous deeds and so forth. So I think there's a problem with seeing the bride here as Israel and Old Testament saint. Okay? The other option might be, is this the church? Now again, this is a common analogy in the Bible. And in fact, the church is explicitly called the bride of Christ. So uh, perhaps my favorite passage that really uh, makes this clear is in Ephesians chapter 5. Now again, Paul's talking to husbands and wives, but he then expands a Christian marriage is to be a picture of Christ and his church. Okay? So uh, he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he, Jesus, might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she would be holy and blameless. Now, that's an image that fits much more closely with this bride who's prepared for the marriage of the Lamb. Okay. And again, remember the lamb is Jesus. So I think there's a very strong argument that can be made that the wife or the bride of Jesus here is the church. Okay. And we'll talk a little bit later when we talk about who comes back with Jesus and so forth um, and resurrected bodies and so forth because it gets a little bit complex. Uh, we'll be dealing with the resurrections and so forth here in chapter 19, but also uh, somewhat extensively in chapter 20, the next time we gather together and study this in chapter 20. The only other possibility is maybe this is a combination of all of the above. And there's some merit to this view, although I'm going to end up saying in the end, I think it's the church. But it is clear when we get to Revelation chapter 20, okay? And we get to chapter 21 and we see the New Jerusalem that everyone is a part of the bride of Christ. All the redeemed are part of the bride of Christ. So um, the New Jerusalem is clearly made up of both Jews, members of the church, tribulation saints, and millennium saints. However, the resurrection chronologies are problematic. Here, so I'm going to mention this a little bit. We'll take a look at it some next time as well. Revelation 20, verse 4. Okay. I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded because of their testimony of Jesus and because of the word of God, and those who had not worshipped the beast or his image, had not received the mark on their forehead on their hand. They came to life, and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So it seems clear here that those who perish 
in the tribulation period, those of the redeemed, those who came to faith in Christ during the tribulation period, they do not experience resurrection until the beginning of the millennial kingdom period. So they are not the ones that come back with Jesus. They are not the bride. Okay? But you might say, what about Old Testament saints? And there's a couple of passages here that I think are interesting. The book of Daniel, chapter 2, is one of the most explicit statements about the resurrection in the Old Testament. Notice what it says. It says here that many of those who sleep in the dust of the ground will awake. These to everlasting life, but others to disgraced and everlasting contempt. So Daniel seems to speak of a general resurrection of some to uh, the reward of the kingdom, to others, uh, hell and judgment. Okay? And then if we look at Revelation 20, verse 6, we see a little bit more here. Blessed and holy is the one who has a part in the first resurrection. Over these, the second death has no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him for a thousand years. So now, we'd have to say, if you believe in a pre-trib rapture, um, there's sort of a pre-first resurrection, so that when Christ comes back, the dead in Christ will rise and they will go with him to heaven and they'll be part of this bride of Christ. We will be in heaven with our resurrected bodies, but there will be souls in heaven from the tribulation period, perhaps even from the Old Testament saints, who will not be resurrected yet, and will not be resurrected until the beginning of the millennium. Okay? Now, I am open to the idea that Old Testament saints like Daniel, John the Baptist, who died before Christ rose again and was not a part of the church, and countless other godly saints from the Old Testament, Abraham, Isaac, you know, the whole, all the people, Moses, that might possibly be partakers with the church at the rapture. I don't know that the Bible's clear on this. Um, so it's possible that these Old Testament saints will be in heaven and be a part of this bride. So um, I'm not sure the Bible's entirely clear on that. Okay? So that's kind of my answer to this question of the bride is ready. Who is the bride? And, 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 and who is it that is going to take this position as being the bride of Christ? And then we see in verse 9 the blessedness of those who are invited to the marriage supper. Verse 9. Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. Now, again, we have some challenges here. The marriage supper and its relationship to the marriage and the bride, how are we to understand that? We can take the position that the church is the bride, is the wedding feast the same thing as the wedding? Or is it two different things involving two different groups? Again, if we see the bride as the church, we can easily just see a distinction between the bride, the church, that is already resurrected in heaven, that they're with Jesus, they return with him, defeat his enemies, and the tribulation saints are resurrected in the first resurrection following the defeat of the Antichrist in Armageddon. Old Testament saints could fit into this category, or we could see them being resurrected to enjoy the benefits of the Millennial Kingdom. So if I were to look at this, it seems best to me to understand the bride and those who are invited to the wedding feast as two different groups. Okay. The bride is the bride of Christ, I believe, is the church. But all of the redeemed, all of the survivors of the tribulation are going to be believers. 
they're going to be people who were not followers of the beast because those people are going to be executed by Christ when he comes back. We'll see that shortly. So there'll be some mortals who are alive, those 144,000 witnesses and so forth, who will be alive and who will populate the new millennial kingdom. But there will be resurrected people there as well. There'll be Old Testament saints, certainly. By this point in time, they're resurrected. There are members of the church. There are all the people who came to life and died, excuse me, who died in the tribulation period that now have come to life and been resurrected. They also, so everyone at the beginning of this millennium will participate in the great wedding feast. So I don't think the wedding feast takes place in heaven. I think, and uh, I got this idea from Robert Thomas, he points out that the entire millennium is the wedding feast. Now, it's a long time for a feast. If you don't understand anything about Jewish wedding customs, the, the bride and groom would be called together. They would celebrate the marriage ceremony, and then they would go into the feast, and the feast would often last for seven, seven days as, as a celebration of the wedding. And so this seems to be the imagery here, that the bride has made herself ready. She's resurrected. She's in heaven. She comes back with her husband-to-be or maybe husband and defeats his enemies. And then everyone is now invited to the great wedding feast, this time of great blessedness and plenty and celebration, which the millennial kingdom will be. Whew! <laughs> There's a lot to unpack here and try to figure out. So hopefully... Uh, we've done a good job with that, and when I get to heaven, I'll want to know if I was right or not on some of these calls. Then we see, unfortunately, an example of improper worship in verse 10. Then I, John, fell at his feet to worship him. Remember, this is an angel who's explaining this to him. But he said to me, don't do that. I also am a fellow servant of yours and the brethren who hold the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. So again, and this is going to be the second of three times in the book where John is so overwhelmed with the majesty of what he's being shown that he falls down and tries to worship an angel. And the angel's very explicit. No, no. It's improper for you to worship me. The only one that we can worship is God. And of course, Jesus. So the fact that Jesus is worshipped throughout the book is an incredible statement of his divinity over and over again. And this last statement, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's what prophecy is all about. It's all about Jesus. It's the testimony of Jesus. It's not only the testimony that Jesus gives, but it's the testimony about Jesus as well. That's the spirit of prophecy. That's what it's all about. Well, we've now come to kind of the apex of the whole New Testament, and that is the return of Jesus Christ. Um, I love this drawing. You can barely see the sword coming out of his mouth, his red robe, his hair and visage and the crown upon his head and so forth. And so we're going to unpack those things a little bit here in the next few moments as we look at this and uh, move along. Okay, so uh, verses 11 through 21 for the rest of the chapter, it gives us the return of Jesus Christ. By the way, let me just say something here as an interpretive footnote. Um, at the beginning of this class, we talked about some of the different uh, interpretive schools of the book of Revelation. And one of the more uh, popular schools that's been increasing in popularity of late is called the Preterist School. And this viewpoint takes almost the entire book of Revelation and says it's all written 
to Christians right before the destruction of Jerusalem. And so all the plagues and the tribulations and the sufferings that are written in the book, and of course Babylon is Rome, and it's all about things that happened long ago and were fulfilled long ago. But I'll tell you something. At some point in time, everybody has to stop and say, this book's talking about the future. Now, one of the fundamental teachings of the Christian faith is the fact that Jesus died, rose again, and what? Ascended into heaven and will one day return. Right? So the second coming of Jesus Christ is one of the foundational core teachings of the New Testament and the gospel. Just as important as his death, burial, and resurrection, his ascension, and his coming back. And this is the future. Chapter 20 talks about the great judgment. Chapter 21 and 22 talk about the eternal kingdom and the new, and the new heavens and the new earth and the new Jerusalem. They talk about eternity. That's all the future, brothers and sisters. There's no way around that. So at some point in time, no matter what your interpretive twist is on this book, you've got to say, okay, now we're talking about the future. Not everything happens quickly or right away. So here we see something that is clearly a discussion about Jesus coming back. Now, again, I might also say in response to those who take an amillennial viewpoint here and who think that this is, a lot of this language is symbolic and so forth, but usually they see what the scripture says here about Jesus returning is literal. So we say, okay, Jesus is going to come back. He's going to destroy his foes and then he's going to reign forever. And they say, okay, that's literal. But as soon as we get to chapter 20, where it talks about him reigning on the face of the earth for a thousand years, that's when they just sort of throw all that literal stuff out the window. And now we're just talking symbolically about eternity. So you can't play games like that. You can't say, oh, this description of Jesus coming back, we take as literally happening. But chapter 20, which talks about a thousand years reigning on the face of the earth, we don't think that's literal. So you're picking and choosing what you think is literal and what you think is not literal. All right, so that's enough of that. I'm ranting and raving a little bit here about interpretive uh, schools of thought here in the book. But let's take a look at this description here of Jesus coming back. So we first are describing the rider on the white horse, verses uh, 11 through 16. The first thing we see is his character. Verse 11, and I saw heaven opened. Wow, this is going to be a sight, a sight to behold. And I behold a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. See, there's a time for righteous judgment and righteous war. I'm not a warmonger, but you're really naive if you think that if we all just sit down and sing Kumbaya, that everybody will get along in this world. And there's no such thing as evil and all of that. There is such thing as evil. And what we've seen here in the book of Revelation is that evil has run rampant and taken control of the entire earth. And so when Jesus comes back, he's faithful and he's true, and he makes war upon these people righteously because of their great evil and wickedness. We then see his head. His eyes are a flame of fire. Again, eyes that are flames of fire are penetrating eyes. They see the truth. They judge. And on his head are many diadems. Not just one crown. Not just ten crowns like the beast, but many diadems. And here we have a transliteration of the Greek word, for a crown of glory, a crown of a ruler. And he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. Now, I was thinking about this, and I, you know, I think I've come up with this name. 
I think I know what it is. No, I'm just kidding. But that is the classic, this is that, right? You know, uh, they want to, everybody wants to figure out and speculate who, who the Antichrist is. How does his name add up to 666? Hey, the text says here, no one knows except Jesus what this name is. Now, maybe we'll be told about it after the fact here. But <laughs> no one knows. I'm amazed, continually amazed. Uh, I think back to the recent example we had with Harold Camping and Family Radio not too long ago. Most of you remember that, where they actually set the date when Jesus was going to return. Remember that? I remember right, driving up and down Interstate 95. There's big billboards up there saying, you know, get ready for, I forget what the date was, May 12th or whatever it was. It was back in 2012 when all the doomsday people were going nuts because of the Mayan calendar and all that stuff, right? And I'm like, don't they remember what Jesus said? No one knows the day or the hour when he's going to come back. So don't try to predict it. No one knows this name. And again, it speaks of the exclusivity of Jesus. And there's going to be mysteries in heaven. We're not going to understand everything because if we understood everything, we would be God. Right? There's still going to be wonder. There's still going to be mystery in heaven. Now I'm hoping to get a lot of my questions answered. Right? I hope about you. And I, and I do believe that when we do get to heaven, a lot of things will be made clear. But still, you know, to, to fully grasp God, you'd have to be God. So I think there's going to be mystery here. And here we see his companions or his raiment, excuse me. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. Now, there's a couple ways you can take this robe dipped in blood. One is to see it as his own blood. He did, in fact, shed his blood for our sins and so forth. But I think in light of the context, in the light that this is a judgment passage, that we have to go back to chapter 14, where we see the great wine press of God's wrath. Right? Where uh, it's a very vivid analogy of the reaping and the harvest and throwing the grapes of the wicked people into this great wine press that is going to be beaten down by God. And of course, what happens when that takes place is that the wine is spilled up and splatters all over the garments of whoever's doing that uh, pressing of the wine. So to me, that is a better image here, that that's why the robe is dipped in blood, because he's coming in judgment to shed an enormous amount of blood of his enemies. And his name is called the Word of God. This, by the way, is a great proof, I believe, for John the Apostle being the author of the book, he is the one who begins his epist excuse me, his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Right? So to John, the Word of God is a designation for Jesus. And again, this is the clothing that he is wearing. And then who comes with him? Verse 14. The armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. Now, there's no mention that there's any weapons with this army. The only weapon is the sword that comes out of Jesus' mouth, which we'll see in a moment. So this, I believe, is the bride. The description of the bride previously in the chapter of wearing white linen right, is the same. So uh, I believe that we will return with Jesus Christ, riding these white horses. We won't need weapons because Jesus is going to execute his own judgment upon the wicked at that point in time. But we will come back with him. That's going to be quite a, quite a cavalry charge, I think, uh, to be there and come down from heaven riding these white stallions and so forth. So again, I take that as 
the bride of Christ there. His power, verse 15, from his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations and will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. Now again, we think back to this winepress analogy in why his robe is dipped in blood and so forth. From his mouth comes the weapon, the sharp sword, so that with it he strikes down the nations. Now, uh, we know that the word of God is called a sword in Hebrews chapter 4. The word of God is living and active like a sharp two-edged sword. Um, Some have said that he simply wipes them out with a word from his mouth, and that's entirely possible here. The other illusion might be that it's simply a sword of judgment. The sword is an image of punishment and justice. And so the act and action of striking down the nations is symbolized by the sword coming out of his mouth. But I, like to, I think I like the idea that since it comes out of his mouth, it must be a spoken word that's like a sword and actually executes all of his enemies. Um, then there's a mention in here of ruling them with a rod of iron. And this, I think, speaks to his rule during the millennial kingdom, that it will be absolute. It will be perfect and absolute and there will be no rebellion tolerated. And why would you rebel, right? You know, the curse is going to be lifted. There's going to be absolute perfect justice. We live in a world right now that is just breaking itself apart over the idea of justice. And everywhere we look in this world, we see injustice. We see people who suffer uh, who shouldn't. People who are oppressed and shouldn't be the poor oppressed by the rich, the have-nots oppressing the, I mean, the haves oppressing the have-nots, and so forth. And so what will happen in this new kingdom is that Jesus will reign with a rod of iron, but it'll be a reign of righteousness and godliness and goodness. And so there'll be perfect justice for once in this world. Because where we look, so often there's lack of justice. Now, I'm not saying we should just give up. We should work for social justice. We should work for equal treatment for everyone. And it should always be our goal. But while we live in this sinful world, it's fallen and we'll never find perfect justice until Jesus comes back. Verse 16, his name. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. King of kings and Lord of lords. Again, the stress is that Jesus is coming back to rule the earth. He came in his first advent as a little humble baby born to a poor family in the middle of nowhere, right? Born in a stable crib. He's going to come back as the King of kings and the Lord of Lords. He will rule the nations with a rod of iron. So again, this is this great description of Jesus as he's returning with his church, with these great saints. And then we have a rather gruesome image here, I must say, verses 17 and 18. The invitation to the great supper of God. This is... uh, (laughs) Pretty graphic. When I saw an angel standing in the sun and he cried out with a loud voice saying to all the birds which fly in mid heaven, come assemble for the great supper of God that you may eat the flesh of kings and the flesh of commanders, the flesh of mighty men, the flesh of horses and those who sit upon them and the flesh of all men, both free men and slaves, small and great. That pretty much covers it, right? Kings all the way down to slaves rich and poor, mighty and not so mighty. All those who've taken the mark of the beast, all those who've gathered together in opposition to the Lord Jesus Christ, he is going to execute at this great last battle. And so there's an invitation to these animals to come because there's going to be millions who are going to die at this last battle. So in contrast to what we saw previous the marriage supper of the lamb this is the meal you want to miss 
Instead of partaking of the main dish, you are the main dish. It's an astounding image, the dead bodies of the enemies of God being devoured by millions and millions of birds. I'm told that the prophet Ezekiel spoke of it taking years to completely get rid of all of the dead bodies from this final battle. And so as we near the end of the chapter here, we see the final section is the destruction of the beast and his army. And so verse 19 gives us the army of the beast assembling against Christ to come and, and try to fight against him. And again, this is the, the ultimate fool's errand. You're going you're gonna to go to battle with human weapons and somehow you think you're going to defeat the creator of the universe? No, ain't going to happen. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. Um, there they are, thinking we got all the weapons. And remember, we saw in the uh, bowl judgments that uh, great demons working signs and powers were working to assemble all this great army in Armageddon to fight against the Lamb and the return of the Lamb and uh, all the deception that, yeah, we're going to defeat God finally and we're going to set up our own human kingdom that's going to reign forever and all those lies that are going to be spoken. And what happens? Well, verse 20 happens. There's not even a battle. We call this a battle, but it's not a battle. It's just like, boom, it's over. And what happens? The beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive into the lake of fire that burns with brimstone. Go directly to hell. Do not pass the battle. Do not get 200 bucks. Go directly to hell. And the battle's over. Just like that. And there's really, no, there's really no battle here because verse 21 says the rest are killed by the sword out of Christ's mouth. Verse 21, and the rest were killed with the sword which came out of the mouth of him who sat on the horse and all the birds were filled with their flesh. So, Jesus has come back. The great battle of Armageddon turns out to be not really a battle at all. A group gathered together to oppose Jesus, and they're wiped out. The leaders are thrown directly into hell. The lake of fire is the image of hell in the latter part here of the book of Revelation. And the rest of their followers are executed. And the great supper of God is a sort of gruesome picture of all of the birds in the heavens coming and, and having a great feast on the dead bodies of those who were slain. So Jesus has come back. He's come back not as a humble servant, but as a reigning king. He comes back to make righteous war on the forces of evil. To those who've rejected him, who accepted the mark of the beast and worshipped the beast, the beast and his false prophet are cast into hell and they are executed. And so... That ends chapter 19. Well, it's been a good study here. It's a sobering study. And I just want to say, you know, whose team do you want to be on? I want to be on Christ's team. Don't buy into the deception that you can somehow survive the future apart from Christ. You can somehow maintain your independence from him and you can follow other gods and other human leaders and so forth. No. The result in that will be devastation and destruction. So turn to Christ. Follow him. And if you don't and the rapture happens and all the Christians are gone, remember that and don't take the mark of the beast and turn and repent and come to faith in Christ. There'll still be a chance. 
even after this stuff begins. But at this point in time, at the very end, there's no chance. Everybody's, everybody's chosen their team. You're on the Antichrist team, you're going you're gonna to suffer death with him, destruction. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you that Jesus is coming back. Thank you that Jesus is coming back as a reigning king with great power and glory and will have victory over his enemies. And we pray as we, next week, we look forward to a discussion of the great time of blessedness the time of the millennial kingdom, the time of the new heavens and the new earth that are our inheritance as followers of Jesus Christ. We pray that you'll encourage our hearts with this. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Bye. We'll see you next week.